Hey everybody, Gil here with The Sailing Vessel, Dream Chaser. And this week's episode, we're going to start really working on putting on the Allwood MA. This is a, a product that I've uh, had other people recommend to me. I really wanted to try it. We tried doing La Tonkinoise varnish, and I'm also going to do some of the product in Allwood MA, just to see how hard it is to apply and how well it looks. Uh, my understanding is it's a multi-part system. Essentially what happens is you sand down to bare wood, and you apply a primer. The primer soaks down into the wood, and then after that cures, you actually put on the first uh, layer of what they call clear gloss. Uh, this creates a chemical bond that remains flexible between the primer that's in the wood and the actual top coat. Well, essentially, it's, it's like a varnish. Um, you build this up somewhere between seven and eight layers, depending on you know the look you're looking for. Um, and it has a very, very specific application method. So I actually created a whole schedule. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put a link to our website, to our free stuff right up here. And if you go there, download the um, Allwood MA application schedule. Uh, essentially what it is, is it has the the uh, instructions and data sheets for how to apply both the primer as well as the top coat, how to sand it, what the um, uh, a coatability timeframes are between coats uh, and also a schedule that you can put in. So you have to think about this a little bit. It's the reason I didn't do it in an earlier episode. I was going to do it down at the boat. And what I found out is, uh, depending on the temperature and the relative humidity, there's very specific time frames by which you need to apply the next coat. All right, the first thing we're going to do is get this stuff set up in this empty storage shed. It'll give me a good working area, uh, a week's worth of time or so. It'll be plenty of time to get enough coats on this, but it'll certainly make it easier having it inside, out of the direct sun. Uh, I don't have to worry about it, uh, heating up the material and curing even faster than I might want it otherwise. I have essentially uh, talked my way into an empty storage shed for a week. It's going to give me the ability to put it inside, not worry about uh, direct sun and whatnot. So let's go, let's go ahead and take a look. I'll show you what I got going on. So I'll tell you, the first thing that surprised me is I was, um, you know, I'd sanded all this wood down. You've probably seen it in previous episodes. I sanded it down with 100 to get all the old epoxy and varnish off of them. Uh, went through 150, 180, 220 grit. And I did all these between 220 and 240 grit. So today as I'm rereading the application guides, the primer actually has a very specific instruction on it that says not to sand anything finer, finer than 120 grit. I've already done that. So uh, I had essentially had to waste some material today, uh, you know, essentially sanding this out again to 120. Um, it was an easy job because it was really just a matter of roughing up the surface. But it's interesting to know that that's the way this is. So often, you know, you sand down to something in the 220, 240, 320 grit range before you start applying varnishes. This one's a little bit different. Uh, so the primer has to be no a finer than 120 grit. So now that I've moved everything into this bigger storage shed that gives me the ability to walk all the way around it, uh, I went ahead and sanded by hand uh, down to 120 grit. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you that just in fast motion. Uh, it, pretty easy, a light sand. I took a small wooden block to do the flat surfaces and then just curved my fingers like this and went around the edges of the boom. You'll see that in this video. Uh, you'll notice it's still taped up from, from a previous episode. Uh, as I sanded it, I tore a little bit of the tape in a few areas. I just re-taped it to make sure it's all in good shape. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is a, it's a 10 by 20 storage shed. It's completely empty. I set a table in here so I can have a couple of my small pieces and parts right here that I'll be working on uh, applying the finish to and the large area for the boom. You might remember from a previous episode, I decided to go ahead and epoxy the very end of the boom. And the reason I did that is these end grains in the wood sort of act as uh, capillaries or straws, and I didn't want them to wick or pull moisture into the wood. Typically, end grain is the most susceptible area for water intrusion. So I went ahead and uh, epoxy this. I probably put about six or eight coats of epoxy on here, just a uh, special clear uh, hardener with a 105 resin from West Systems. And what you're seeing here is it's scuffed up. I went ahead and used that 120 grit and just sanded this nice and smooth. And then on the bottom side of this, there was a little bit of a run there. Uh, a collar goes over this whole thing, and I didn't want that to be too tight. So I went ahead and sanded that as well. 
With all of the parts now sanded down, the important thing is to remove any of that dust. We don't want any of that getting into the surface or preventing it from soaking down into the wood itself. So we're going to use acetone to go ahead and remove this. Uh, I'm using acetone because it specifically is one of the three uh, solvents that Allwood MA recommends in their data sheet to use for cleaning the surface. Um, you'll notice here I'm just using uh, essentially clean white towels. Uh, typically you want to use a lint-free rag. Um, I actually used a couple of old socks that were bleached and cleaned and, and had been sitting drying for a long time. Because I intend to wipe these down with acetone, they're going to get dust and whatnot in them, and I'm going to recirculate them quickly. You'll see here I continue to turn them over to, get, to let the clean side uh, be what's mating with the surface of the wood. Um, so just doing this boom, you know, I'll go through three or four of these uh, socks and fold them four different, you know, four ways so I can essentially have four sides I can use, um, and wiping it down very liberally with acetone. What I really want to do is I'm trying to remove all of the oils, either from my skin, from touching it, or from the wood itself. Teak wood tends to be an oily wood, and frankly, at uh, you know, 88 degrees already outside, or 82 degrees, whatever it is, uh, it's already a bit warm. And, and as I was sanding it, I started noticing a drip of sweat that hit it. Like that's Nothing will ruin a finish quicker than a drop of your own sweat popping down into it. So I have another towel I've been wiping my forehead with just to make sure that, uh, that we keep this nice and clean. It's important to know, though, if you touch the wood, remember you have oil in your skin and that's going to keep it from bonding, so be sure to use the acetone to really clean that up. So there were a couple of spots where I ripped that tape. I needed to retape it. As I was retaping it, I kind of had my palm sitting down on the wood itself. When I got finished doing that, I could actually see a darker spot right where I had touched. It was perfectly evident of that oil in your skin. So again, I used another rag, dipped it in acetone, really scrubbed on it with the acetone until it, it essentially got rid of that darker spot. Uh, it dried it right up. Essentially, the acetone pulled the oils out of the wood from my skin that had went in there. And I have the smaller parts over here sitting on a couple of these little pyramid spacers so you can, uh, you can get the bottom corners of them as well. And I'm going to be applying the first coat of Allwood MA Clear Primer. So it's kind of interesting. As I was reading the, uh, the instruction guide, um, both of the primer as well as the clear gloss, though I suspect it's probably more important on the clear gloss, but since it says it on both, I will be doing it on both. Um, both of the instruction manuals specifically say to pour the material into whatever it is you're going to be using to apply the material, right? You don't want to dip a brush into the surface of the, of the can, just like varnish, and that's the reason why these are so small. Um, but it suggests you pour it into your container. It suggests a deeper, narrower container because humidity is actually what cures this. Um, we're at about 82% relative humidity today. You can go up as high as 95%, um, and that's what cures it. So it recommends the deeper the can, the less surface area uh, of, of, is you know, kind of open to be impacted by that humidity. But it suggests that you, um, you pour your material into your, your, your vessel, and let it decant for 30 minutes, like a fine wine. You got to decant, decant your red wine. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to pour some in here, and uh, we'll let it decant. All right, I'm going to start, since I've never used this before, I'm going to start on the bottom of this. And it says not to try and put it on a, a, you know, really thin. Let it really soak in. So I'm putting a little bit of this on a little bit thicker than I might otherwise. It definitely is a lot thinner than a varnish. This primer is you know, almost like a, uh, I won't say it's quite as thin as a, a paint thinner, but pretty close. <laughs> Feels like it has a high solvent level it's probably to, to get it to soak in.
All right, so we have the first coat of primer on. Um, and it's starting to tack already. It says it gets tacky fairly quick. Well, as I waited for that primer to dry, I started having problems with the air conditioner over on Last Affair. Um, I went and checked it out. It definitely needs some work, but it's hotter than it can be, so I'm gonna go back first thing in the morning and get the work done early. Well, please come along and join me as I walk through the aisles of my local Walmart store. I ran over to my storage shed this morning to pick up some electrical crimpers and wire cutters and things I would ultimately need to do the work on the air conditioner blower. But unfortunately, when I got over there, the electrical gate, the entry gate, wouldn't work. Uh, I called the after hours number and they were going to send somebody but didn't know exactly when it would be. So I needed to get this stuff done and decided to pop into Walmart and buy some of this crappy stuff that I'll probably end up throwing away. So here's the crimpers as well as the wire cutters and I really don't even like these little um, crimps in here they're not marine grade so not really what I want again not the way I intended to start my day but I have my parts I'm gonna go get checked out and run over to the boat and get this stuff going hey everybody Gil here from the sailing vessel dream chaser but aboard last affair today so a little bit unplanned um we, so while the Dream Chasers were getting work done, we've had this boat. It's continued to be my office boat. My daughter was staying in it for a while. We had the camper. Um, we had our cats still in here. We were coming down every day and taking care of the cats. But um, we came down the other day, and the air conditioner was making this god awful racket. I'm like, man, I'm going to look at that. I came back by the next morning, and it was dead. It was off. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what it was. I, I, it, I took it all apart. It felt like the bearings in the actual blower fan. Uh, I put, I had to, when I could get it out and look at it, what you can see is it would start up, the, the fan would begin spinning, and then the fan would just sort of stop abruptly, like, <laughs> like almost like a ground. And when you moved it back and forth, they had to play in it. So, I assumed that was the issue. And I was really looking for the easy way out. I wanted to go see if I could just get bearings. I mean, you know, the reality is bearings are bushings. You can usually get them at a bearing store for five, six dollars, you know, so if you can get them out, they're usually inexpensive. Um, I used to do electronic repair on grocery scanners and they had bearings inside of those. You, know, you go to the company and it's $300 for the little spindle assembly. You run down to a local bearing shop and it was $8 for the bearing and 15 minutes to put them in and away you go, right? So um, anyway, I, I really wanted to see if I could do this relatively inexpensively. I struggled with it. Um, I couldn't get the actual uh, squirrel cage fan off the shaft of the motor. And I thought, you know, if I do this and I bend one of the blades and the squirrel cage fan gets out of balance, well, even if I do get new bearings, then I'm just going to keep screwing it up. So I actually found a good price on a replacement blower, um, blower motor and fan. It wasn't the whole assembly, but it was the blower motor and fan. Uh, I just got that and um, down aboard this morning to put it on. I came over here early in hopes to beat the heat, which it's not horrible down here. I have one of these portable air conditioners, um, you know, these little room air conditioners. I put that in here just so it was a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not horrible. Uh, and the noise you hear in the background is the boat running, because honestly I haven't started it in probably a month. Uh, what I love is, you know, here's a 1978 English-made Perkins motor. I go up there, turn the key on, push the button, turns over two times, and bum, 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 fires right up. So I love that old Perkins. Uh, it's dirty, and it's ugly, and it drips oil, and it starts every damn time. <laughs> it's a nice problem to have. So let me show you what I have over here. As you can see, I have the unit pulled out of the cupboard that it sits in and I've got it sitting on top of a trash can, a piece of wood, and a dehumidifier just so that I don't have to disconnect all the electrical connections to it. But I was able to pull the blower motor assembly right out of this section here and cut all the wires that came off of it. So let me show you what I have with that. And here's the actual blower assembly. I'm just now putting this plastic shroud on. This is what mounts it to the um, actual air conditioning unit and allows this whole piece to rotate. Uh, the reason it rotates is because the orientation of this particular self-contained unit, you can have the blower aiming up, left, or right. So it's kind of nice to uh, to have this piece um, on here where it swivels inside the unit. So I'm going to finish screwing that together, and then I'm going to go assemble it onto um, onto my unit right over there. All right, nothing's going on fast with this, but I've got the housing back on. And I've been working on the drain system on this thing. It's been having a bit of a problem. I have something called a condensator. Um, I'll talk about that where it's a little quieter for a minute. But I reworked the drain system. Got all the wiring connected back up. Just about to put the wiring harnesses on and put her back inside of the cupboard. I decided to rework the drain system on that air conditioning unit. So condensation forms in the pan at the bottom of it. And uh, 
I didn't want the stuff just draining down into the bilge if at all possible. So I installed something called a condensator. It uses a suction, a little filter, and a suction and a one-way valve. And it's essentially a small venturi pump on the outbound water circulation line. So essentially the water passing through the venturi pump creates a suction, which pulls from this small side over here. This is a little check valve, so the water can't go the other way. It pulls from that, and this side connects to the drain in the bottom of the con condensation pan. Um, I've had a problem with mine where it sort of puddles in there and gets rather full. And it was just based on the fact that this was higher than the actual pan. So now I have the drain pan dropping down to the cupboard below it, where I'm then installing the Venturi pump, um, one-way check valve, and the filter. So I spent a little bit of time cleaning all the pan and the lines and soaking these with boiling water and a brush. Uh, that took a little bit of time today, but I think it's time well spent, given that I have access, easy access to it with the unit out of the, uh, out of the cupboard there. So let me go ahead and put this whole thing back together. Oh, here we go. She's quietly humming along right here. I noticed this little piece right here cracked. Right there, a little cover over those capacitors. If I have some super glue, I'm just gonna glue the cover back on. I'm on the shelf below the air conditioner, and this is a small filter. This is uh, the drain from the condensation pan. It goes through this filter, out here to a small check valve, and then this line here goes up to the Venturi valve on the output side of the um, water circulation pump. So every once in a while, I'll be able to see, I see little air bubbles go in this direction, which is good. That's what we want. Uh, ultimately means that, see if I can introduce a little air there. But it ultimately means that this is sucking the water out there. I can see a bubble going up right there. So it just slowly pulls it up. Whew. I said it wasn't too hot down here, but after a couple hours, it's pretty warm. Uh, Got the air conditioner fixed, cleaned all the water lines, the drain lines, the condensation lines. I decided to flush out the entire system. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I put pressure into the system to, you know, a lot more pressure than what the typical circulation pump does. And um, essentially I hooked it to a garden hose, plumbed that in and shut everything off except for one output. Um, and then turned the hose on full blast and, you know, it sputtered and spit a bunch of brown goo out. And then like in the water was like this puddle of brown, just you know, mud. It's the stuff that forms on the bottom of your boat and everything else that forms in those lines. But by running that good high pressure through it with a big burst like that, it kind of blows all that crap out of there, if you would. Um, you know, obviously you want to be careful. You don't want to put so much pressure on it. You you cause any issue. But I know it can handle the pressure of the, the garden hose here. I've done it a number of times. Uh, but once I did that on the starboard side um, uh, output of the water circulation, I went ahead and turned off the starboard side, turned on the port side, let it run out that way, and then I turned both of them off and I opened up the valve on the bottom side of the boat that sucks the water in and the valve on the outside of the circulation pump, essentially back flush the pump and the filter. Um, and I let that run for a while and I could actually see a little bit of brown coming up around the side of the boat. So it really it really did push a lot of that stuff back out into the, you know, back out of the lines and back into the water. It's and it's just silt. It's the stuff that's in the water that gets picked up and, and sits in the lines. Um, but the good news is the air conditioner is quietly humming along back there and cooling things off. So that is good news. <laughs> All right. I gave the boat a little scrub-a-dub. It's hot. It's noon. Um, and I got a hood full of trash I took off the boat. So I'm driving it over to the dumpster real slow. And then uh, I think I'm going to start working on the butterfly hatch right at the camper instead of going back down to the boat tonight. We are going to a play tonight. So if I go down to the boat, I'm only going to have about two hours. And I have to come home and shower. So... I figure I'll just stay home and do a little bit of work there. I think I can do that. Well, that's what happens when the camera falls off the dashboard. <laughs> ah, I'll see you guys later. I'm cooling down for a bit. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's video. If you did, don't forget, go ahead and give it a like and a thumbs up. Go ahead and subscribe to it. And if you're interested, Go ahead and go to this website up top. It's at our website. It's under free resources, and we have that all wood schedule planner. If you're doing any kind of bright work or varnish, it's a great uh, tool to let you plan out your coats and then sort of auto calculate the time between coats and what's required. See y'all next week. Oh my gosh, look to your side. Look what's there. <laughs>